This is the BV Magazine podcast, your genuine slice of rural Dorset life, presented by Jenny Devitt and Terry Bennett. This is May 2022, Episode 3. We hope you enjoy it. Farming. Outwitting the beetle and a need for sensible rules for water by NFU County Chair George Hosford. There we were, a few days ago, hunting around in flowering rape for evidence that there'd been any flea beetle attack this season. Eventually, we found one larva embedded in a stem, far short of anything to worry about. Since the Europe-wide ban on neonicotinoid seed treatments in 2013, we have tried countless methods to outwit the little devils, which have decimated the UK rape crop over recent years. The flea beetle is a formidable pest. The adult will attack the tiny emerging plants shortly after sowing in autumn, and on many of the plants that survive, the beetle lays eggs, which eventually hatch, and then attempt to burrow into the stems as the plant grows in late autumn and into early spring. They can weaken plants considerably, and when you think you've escaped the autumn onslaught, you find patches of plants in spring where they've given up, having been hollowed out. We've tried applying smelly manures, sown companion crops to distract them, sown early, even grazed the rape off with sheep in the hope that the sheep actually eat the larvae and the plants. Overall larvae numbers on this farm were lower in 2021 than 2020 and appear to be lower still this year, the fourth since forsaking insecticides. Can we dare to believe that beneficial predators are making a comeback? Now we aren't repeatedly killing them off with increasingly unsuccessful chemical attempts to control the flea beetle? In a vain hope to encourage a bit of rain, it may. Is it appropriate, as I write this on the 23rd of April, to have a good moan about the very dry, cool and windy weather? Our spring barley is seriously struggling. It was sown into rapidly drying seed beds, which, in spite of our intentions to direct drill, had to be cultivated to make a half-decent seed bed. A return to the field with a heavy flat roll this week has been required to try to encourage some late germination where there are gaps, and to conserve what little moisture is there. The spring beans, usually more sensitive to lack of moisture than most crops, are holding out at the moment. We managed to direct drill some of them into the kinder soils and in two small fields we're using them as a break with which to improve some worn-out permanent pasture. Direct sowing the beans into the turf has so far worked well. Leather jackets, which would otherwise have demolished a cereal crop, are not interested in beans and will have hopefully hatched and left the field before we sow a wheat crop in the autumn and then establish a long-term herbal mixture in the following year. Digging down below the turf finds surprisingly moist soil protected from the wind and sun by the old turf. DEFRA have announced some long-awaited answers for farmers recently. Firstly, their response to the urea fertiliser consultation that they issued a year ago, which had left farmers who are accustomed to using urea fertiliser with no idea whether they could buy, let alone use, any urea this year. The decision means that previously announced restrictions on the use of urea are being postponed, whilst the industry tries to cope with the enormous rise in fertiliser prices that has occurred in the last few months. Urea has traditionally been used as a cheaper form of fertiliser than the more widely used ammonium nitrate, but a major drawback is that it leads to the emission of more ammonia into the atmosphere than AN. Both contribute to global warming, but urea is worse. The decision seems likely in the longer term to lead to a regime which will restrict urea use, force farmers to adjust the timing of applications and only to apply it in conjunction with an inhibitor to help reduce emissions. The second announcement relates to the Farming Rules for Water devised and policed by the Environment Agency which aims to control pollution from farmland to waterways and groundwater. These rules have been contentious from their inception in 2018, when the Environment Agency announced a clampdown on manure spreading in the autumn. The implication was that farmers who produce organic manures would not be able to apply them to any more than a narrow range of permitted crops in the autumn, the time when traditionally many millions of tonnes of manures are applied to newly sown crops. 
Lots more storage capacity would have to be built to carry it safely through until it could legally be applied in the spring. There are many reasons why this draconian ruling didn't make sense, and I plan to return to this subject soon. But, to put it concisely, DEFRA have asked the Environment Agency to look at this again and work more closely with farmers to make the system more sensible. No farmers intentionally allow their manures to get into water. They are far too valuable to do that. A confrontational approach helps no one. And I very much hope now that we can move forward with an environmentally responsible and economically justifiable blend of common sense and practical regulation. War and Water, or Lack of It, by James Cousins As has been well publicised, April was a very dry month, with only 33 millimetres, or one and a half inches, of rain recorded in the month at Rawston Farm. The winter crops seem to be surviving well, with the oil seeds well out in their yellow flowers. The spring crops desperately need a good drink, however, or yields will be reduced considerably. We are currently sowing maize, our final crop of the spring. With the current high cost of fertiliser, we have put a cover of farmyard manure on the fields before ploughing. We hope this will give the crop a good boost without having to add extra fertiliser. The cattle grazing enjoys the dry weather whilst the grass continues to grow. There is little poaching of the fields and they are able to utilise the grass to good effect. The milking cows have certainly benefited from going out to grass and we have been able to save on feeding silage and reduced the amount of bought-in feed that they are required in the winter. We now look forward to silage making, aiming for good quality feed for next winter. Getting the balance between quality and quantity can be challenging, and there is a trend towards cutting more often to improve the quality. Sometimes the quantity can be sacrificed if we don't get sufficient moisture for the following cuts. In my youth, I was very involved with the Young Farmers Organisation, my local club being Blandford. In fact, this is where I met my wife Barbara, who was a farmer's daughter. I have recently been recycled into being involved again with Blandford on their advisory committee. Each year there is a county rally where all the clubs in Dorset compete with each other in many varied events. I was asked to help with the field events, which involved tractor driving, quad bike handling, tying a load of straw bales, to name but a few. A great time was had, with all competitors thoroughly enjoying themselves. The Young Farmers Movement is a tremendous organisation to belong to, where young people can have lots of fun, meet new friends and learn about life in the countryside. The name Young Farmers may be a little off-putting, but anyone under the age of 26 can join in. I'm sure by looking at social media or the YFC website, you will be able to find details and contacts of your local club, see what goes on, and maybe join in. The effect of the war in Ukraine seems to be having far-reaching consequences for our everyday lives now. With energy prices sky high, it seems food prices and availability are being affected. Vegetable oil, in the form of sunflower oil, is being rationed in some shops, with homegrown oilseed being looked at as its replacement. Harvesting oilseeds in the UK will take place in July, and hopefully making up for any shortfall. Maybe in the UK we should look at the possibility of growing more sunflowers. It is also predicted that there may be a shortage of eggs this summer, with many producers deciding that it's uneconomic at the moment to produce eggs due to high feed costs. I think the government needs a wake-up call on food security for this country and not rely on imports to make up any shortfall. Finally, let's hope for some rain for farmers and gardeners whilst we are in the growing season and not to save it up for the harvesting. The Truth Behind Green Credibility by Andrew Livingston Roman Abramovich at Chelsea Football Club, Saudi Arabia buying Newcastle FC and a World Cup hosted in Qatar have all continued to fill the back pages of newspapers in the UK. Not so reputable people and nations for years have used sporting teams and tournaments to change their public reputation. This is called sports washing. In farming and business, something similar occurs – And it's becoming ever more prevalent since COP26 and global plans to be net zero in 2050. This is known as greenwashing. Previously, the main types of greenwashing were seen in companies marketing and advertising. For example, some oil companies in the past have been challenged for advertising heavily on low carbon products, while most of their annual spending is on oil and gas. 
Greenwashing is more commonly now being seen in big businesses investing in land to offset their carbon spend. People may say it's fine as it's a global issue, but are companies doing the right thing if they just throw money at the situation and if we don't try to reduce our carbon usage? Greenwashing is being seen as having a bigger effect on farmers in both Wales and Scotland. In Wales, paid afforestation schemes were set up to encourage farmers to plant trees on their land. But large investment firms have been purchasing Welsh farms and land and planting the trees in order to sell off the carbon offset. Although, once again, it seems great that the environment is being taken care of, but for local communities, it's hard to see their farming heritage ripped up and the land they worked for generations changed forever. As an example, some airlines are known to have bought farms in Wales as they look to offset carbon for their global flights. Land purchasing for carbon offsetting is having a larger effect on farming in Scotland. Last year, two-thirds of land sales in Scotland were done privately, meaning that they never went on the open market, with one-third of those being sold to overseas buyers. Farms sold off the market means that members of the local community are unable to get into farming or expand their current business. On the face of it, greenwashing doesn't quite have the newsworthy nature of sports washing. Most people see any tree planted as a good news story. But it seems that even capturing carbon comes at a cost as businesses look to exploit environmental schemes and local communities to be seen doing the right thing. As with knowing where your food comes from, we must ask ourselves when a business advertises its green credentials, do I know the real story behind this? Nature. Every salad should contain a wild harvest. By Carl Minton. As we move closer to the heights of summer, the outdoors draws us more heavily with its mild temperatures and longer days. What better time to go foraging for some delicious wild edible plants to celebrate the incoming heady days that summertime promises. In May, the hawthorn bushes are heaving with blossoms. Their blooms being a May staple is surely the reason so many May Day traditions of the UK feature their thorny branches. And these flowers can make a great addition to salads and other dishes as an attractive garnish. The young growth of the flower buds and young leaves are all edible now before they mature later in the season and can be used to make more of any side salad. Indeed, at this time of year, I would argue no salad should be denied the inclusion of a wild harvest. Hawthorn can be found in many hedgerows all over the Blackmoor Vale and beyond, and on waste ground and woodlands. It flowers from now to midsummer, sporting five petalled flowers that smell faintly of almonds, with deeply lobed leaves on its thorny, thin branches. Next up, the lime tree is one you really ought to include on your itinerary of May foraging. The young, heart-shaped leaves of small-leaved lime and other species of lime are not only edible but entirely delicious and can make up the bulk of a decent salad. Mild and succulent, they have a great flavour that isn't tainted by the bitterness associated with many wild salad greens. Be sure to harvest the young leaves though before they mature and get a papery texture. If you are really lucky, you may even find an aphid farm curated by ants which has excreted a silvery substance on your leaves. If so, this is a real prize, as it is almost as if the leaf has been dipped in honey. The substance is the equivalent of aphids making lime syrup from the sap for you and leaving it behind. The lime tree is one of the trees that is found growing wild in any space where such habitat is preserved, but also cultivated in parks and the like, making it another easy-to-find specimen for novice foragers. My last choice for May's foraging guide is is the oxeye daisy, sometimes also called the dog daisy. Oxeye daisy is a plant, no doubt you will already recognise, which offers up to us both its flowers and flower buds as table fare. In addition, the leaves are also edible, although tend to become bitter once the flowering has begun. So be sure to harvest only leaves from younger plants. Growing almost anywhere grass grows and isn't too manicured, the oxeye daisy is another incredibly common plant one can pursue with little trouble and will likely be available right through into September or even October. Once harvested, the fun has only just begun 
as there is a plethora of uses for the edible parts of this much overlooked plant. As mentioned, the leaves can be added to salads and the flowers are often cooked in a simple tempura batter. Just the petals can be used to liven up any dish as a garnish. Have I mentioned before that no salad should ever be without some wild flowers? But there are many uses even beyond this. Dried leaves and flowers can be stored and used to make teas when they are out of season, and the fresh versions can be used likewise straight away. The dried leaves can be crushed and used to add to herb mixes, and the flower buds can be pickled like capers. For me, my love of foraging begins and ends in the kitchen, and what better way to spend your May evenings than by enjoying a wild salad with lime and hawthorn, with some daisy tea as the sun sets, before setting about preserving your produce in the kitchen, pickling and drying. Productive bliss, a gift from May's bounty. Not sure about that, Jenny, whether I would fancy too much of those ingredients. What do you think? Well, do you know, I'm absolutely fascinated by the idea that you can eat the leaves of the, of the lime tree. I mean, well, why not? And hawthorn, I, again, I had no idea that, uh, that the flower buds and the young leaves are edible. Of course, it's all flowering at the moment. You know, the superstition about you mustn't cut hawthorn and bring it into the, the flowers into the house because it brings bad luck. Oh, <laughs> I see. Well, anyway, you try some of those and let us know what I'll you think you know. of them. I'll let you know. Yes. Right. Me first. Food and Drink. It's all about the taste by Fanny Charles. If you were lately walking near the Kingsmead Business Park at Gillingham, you might have heard peals of laughter. Go a little closer and the scene looked positively Mediterranean. A group of people sitting on benches around a wooden table enjoying lunch in the unseasonable sunshine. It probably didn't look like work, but the ten people around the table were having a short break from tasting and testing for this year's Great Taste Awards. As a long-standing judge and coordinator at the Great Taste Awards, I am used to the amused head-shaking if I comment that we work hard. Eating interesting food all day, how hard can that be? The truth, of course, is that it is hard work because it's a very responsible job and one which is carried out with real rigour. I have been a Great Taste judge for many years since the Guild of Fine Food, now based in Gillingham, was in Wincanton, near where I live. At that time, I was editing the Blackmore Vale magazine and regularly writing about the activities of the Guild, including the Great Taste and World Cheese Awards. Bob Farrand, who founded the Guild and both award schemes, his son John is now managing director, repeatedly invited me to come and spend the day judging. I always pleaded the demands of work until one day I didn't. So I walked down the road, met some of the judges, listened to Bob's introduction, spent the day tasting dozens of products, and was hooked. I have been a judge ever since, and for some years also a coordinator, one of the people who record the comments and stars were agreed on the products. Bob, a writer, cheese expert, and author of the excellent Cheese Handbook, 2000, always put new judges at their ease by explaining that we all have the same number of taste buds. Some people may have more knowledge of specific products, olive oil or espresso coffee, for example, but that doesn't mean that your opinion on the taste isn't just as valid. If you're still with me, but wondering what the Great Taste Awards are, the best advice is to look around the next time you're in a supermarket, deli or farm shop. You will soon spot products with small black and gold Great Taste Award labels with one, two or three stars. They might be preserves or cider, artisan cheese or handmade biscuits, sausages or ice cream, sea salt or Greek mountain honey. It's a simple idea. Establish a benchmark for quality and encourage producers and retailers to work together to promote great tasting food prepared by dedicated makers using fresh, honest and where possible local ingredients. Launched in 1994, when fewer than 100 food and drink entries were blind tasted by 12 experts across five classes, Great Taste is now arguably the world's leading food award scheme, attracting around 14,000 entries in 2021. Since 1994, more than 150,000 products have gone through the judging process. Each food or drink item is blind tasted by judges from a wide range of food related backgrounds, including chefs, cooks, buyers, retailers, restaurateurs, food critics and writers. The judges look for truly great taste, regardless of branding or packaging. They take into account texture, appearance, aroma and of course the quality of the ingredients. But above all, 
does the product taste truly great? On any given judging day, you may have some glorious experiences. A three-star hazelnut gelato, mouth-watering venison salami, oysters fresh from the pristine seawaters off the Irish coast, or some that are anything but. My worst experience, bar none, still remembered with a shudder, was a dish of seafood intended as antipasto. It included pieces of squid that could have patched shredded bike tyres floating in a sea of rough vinegar. It was hard to imagine how this made it out of the test kitchen, let alone why anyone would put it forward for a great taste star. But the horrors are rare. The majority of products we taste and discuss thoughtfully, professionally and constructively are created and made with care and many will qualify as great tastes. In 2021, a total of 5,383 products were awarded one, two or three stars, of which 497 were from the West Country. This year's great taste judging is now well underway. My most recent experience, typical of the cross-section of people you meet, was a fun and interesting morning with Val Stones, the cake whisperer and former Great British Bake Off contestant, and Biri Ludlow, who makes Indian ready meals in Somerset. The combined taste buds of a great baker, an award-winning Indian cook and me, produced some strong opinions. The pros and cons of a vegan chocolate cake, the level of spicing on a biryani, and stars for several products. When people ask me why I love great taste judging, I have four reasons. I believe that what we do helps to support and promote the work of great artisan and small food and drink producers, and some bigger companies too. I believe we help consumers to discover fine foods they might not otherwise try. I always meet interesting people, and I always learn something. And I I always think, uh, you know, Terry, that um, if you see that little great taste sticker on a product, you think that's going to be worth buying. I'm sure you're right. I'm just wondering whether they need any further great taste judges. Um, ooh, yes, that's a good idea. <laughs> on, Is there something to volunteer for? Yes, maybe we should send in an application. Meet your local sprout and flower in Mir, an article by Rachel Rowe. There's an attractive, colourful display of fresh vegetables and floral bouquets outside sprout and flower on the square in Mir. The smell of fresh fruit and vegetables blended with foliage and flowers greets customers inside. We need to can that smell, smiles owner Sarah Collins. How did you get started? What's the story behind the shop? I've been a florist for 20 years. Then 11 years ago, my family expanded and we needed a bigger house. And then this place popped up in Mir. So we ended up with a bigger house, a shop, and the business started. I'd always worked for other people and thought, I'll give it a go. And the business has grown subtly and slowly. This was originally a greengrocer, but needed some updating. I started the coffee bar around seven years ago, and it's really made the place a hub for people in Mir. It's also a nice stop off for people heading to the southwest, uh, because it's just off the A303. It's a green oasis. People comment about the smell. We do produce our own candles here, but if only we could just can the smell, because everyone comments on it. We were also the first place to have a milk station in Mir, and we sell cheeses and charcuterie. We keep the place looking rustic with lots of upcycled and reclaimed furnishings. It has an earthy feel to the place. How big is the team? We have three full-time staff and five who are part-time. Some do one day a week. What's flying off the shelves right now? Our flowers are always very popular. No one does flowers quite like us. They're very natural, and we buy mostly British flowers, although some are imported. The cakes are another bestseller. People adore our cakes, and I have just got a fantastic new baker. Our coffee is also excellent. I'm told we're the best for miles around. Tell us about some of your local suppliers. Well, almost everything in the shop has a local twist. I have three baking ladies locally. We use Jane's Grains from Tisbury, and we have local cheeses. Our vegetable stall outside is all local, apart from the kohlrabi. We get carrots from North Wiltshire, and we're lucky to have Mere Trout Farm close by. John Hurd's watercress is just down the road, and he always seems to know when I've run out because a fresh box appears in the doorway. What's been your biggest challenge in the last decade? Lockdown. Changing the business was a challenge. We went from a happy florist to a food and veg box assembly line overnight. The whole team came in and we did 40 box deliveries a day. 
Customers could not go all the way into the shop. It was a real challenge for two years. What's your absolute favourite part of the shop? I'm a florist. I love planters and things like that. And what part of the business are you most proud of? The whole thing, and that it's so supported. We have some real characters in Mir, and that I've kept it going for 11 years. Sarah recalled a day last Christmas when two men came in and bought huge bouquets of flowers. One of them couldn't believe the place. He said it was just like being in a storybook, and it was magical. It made me quite emotional to hear that. So what's next? Well, I never really plan anything. I think it's enough. Assistant Fiona looks up thoughtfully and says, I like that every day is different here, and I think this is the type of shop that brings nice people in. It's definitely a place to visit and stop for a coffee. Treat yourself to flowers and enjoy that smell. And you can find Sprout and Flower on the square in Mir. Health. What everyone should eat after a course of antibiotics by Karen Geary. My mother has pneumonia and is currently finishing her second round of antibiotics. When I first had the news, I sent her some supportive supplements. She didn't take any of them. The second round of much stronger antibiotics made her feel nauseous, and I know from her previous experience with the drugs, they also lower her mood. Low mood and depression is a common symptom when taking antibiotics. This is because the bacteria in our gut produces chemicals that affect the way our brains function. When antibiotics get introduced, the balance gets upset. We change the composition of both the good and not so good bacteria in our gut, so it is not surprising that she felt low after the first round. Microbiome science is becoming increasingly sophisticated. The gut is really the second brain, so what we eat and what we don't eat determines our mood, focus and well-being more than we know. This interplay goes further and includes our immune system too and a depleted gut microbiome changes our ability to fight off other viruses and bacteria. Prebiotic foods help the bacterial colonies return back to normal more quickly after a course of antibiotics. As the body cannot break them down, they get passed directly to the gut, where they act as food for good bacteria, allowing the good bacteria to recolonize and discourage the growth of unwanted bacteria by taking up the space in the gut. Prebiotics are substances in plants which come from prebiotic fibres, resistant starches and polyphenols, a type of phytonutrient. They may be especially helpful if probiotics have created constipation. Good prebiotic foods are garlic, onions, leeks, asparagus, bananas, oats, apples, chicory, dark chocolate, flax seeds, Jerusalem antichokes, cold potatoes, legumes, berries and raw honey. These are live organisms which nurture good bacteria, as well as supporting other functions in the body. They help to maintain the order in the gut by maintaining the right acidity and keeping away opportunistic, unwanted bacteria from colonising your gut. Foods containing live organisms include kefir, yoghurt, kombucha, kimchi, sauerkraut, tempeh, miso and natto. Pre- and probiotics go together because probiotics cannot thrive without prebiotics, which create the colonies for the probiotics to develop and nurture. One of my favourite gut-loving meals are stewed apples with no sugar peel on, with kefir sprinkled with cinnamon. This is a winner for constipation if eaten daily. You can also try my gut-loving smoothie bowl. There are some excellent pre-, probiotic and synbiotic pre- and pro supplements on the market now, and some of the science is showing that particular strains of probiotics may also have an impact on different health conditions such as cholesterol and blood pressure. However, the best ones can come up expensive, and the very best ones simply come from real food. However, nutritional therapists often recommend them, especially when a dramatic improvement in gut health is needed, depending upon the condition. Having had two rounds of antibiotics, my mother is now listening to her daughter and is taking some supplements, not probiotics, to help strengthen her immune system. She is on with the kefir and apples daily too now, and recovering nicely. Are you alone or are you lonely? This article by Izzy Anwell of Dorset Mind. Research by the Mental Health Foundation has revealed that people across the UK became a lot more lonely during the pandemic. Loneliness can have damaging effects on physical and mental health, 
Not only can loneliness contribute to and exacerbate mental health issues such as anxiety and depression, but some research suggests that loneliness can be as damaging to physical health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Loneliness is a unique experience. Someone can be lonely due to social isolation, where they have little contact with others, such as an older adult with no family. It's also possible to feel lonely in a room full of people. This is because loneliness can stem from not feeling heard, understood, or cared for by the people around you. Equally, it's possible for someone to feel content being alone. Everyone is different, and all emotions are valid. So, how to combat loneliness? One option is to make a concerted effort to meet new people. Although this can be daunting, it's worth giving yourself a little push, remembering that you can leave if you feel overwhelmed. This may be through joining a club or activity, somewhere you can meet people with similar interests. Alternatively, you can sign up to volunteer for a cause, such as Dorset Mind, where you can meet people with similar passions whilst giving back to the community. There's a charity for every interest, and I guarantee they're all crying out for more volunteers. Helping others can help combat loneliness, as it can make us feel more connected to society. Research suggests that giving back is one of the five proven ways to improve your mental health. Another strategy would be to appreciate and strengthen your existing connections. Sometimes we can be too focused on what we believe are active demonstrations of caring, for instance regular phone calls, but not recognize other gestures, such as a friend who is always willing to help with errands. Additionally, sometimes we're reluctant to make the first move, such as initiating plans. Even if it doesn't work out as you'd hoped, you can feel comfort in the knowledge that you tried. It's possible to become better at managing and accepting the experience of loneliness. The first step is to accept the feeling, learn to sit with it, and know that you can survive it. Try to learn to enjoy your own company by making an effort to do enjoyable things. Follow a routine of self-care or start a new activity. Rediscover the benefits of enjoying your own company. You can also learn strategies the better to manage difficult emotions such as loneliness through various talking therapies and psychological treatments. If your feelings of loneliness are affecting your ability to function, seek additional support. Speak to your GP or in a crisis, call 999 or the Samaritans at 116-123. For more resources and support, visit dorsetmind.uk. Books. Book Corner. This month's book choices from Wayne Winston of Winston's Books in Sherborne. First of all, A Lady's Guide to Fortune Hunting, priced £14.99. Pence. Sophie Irwin, who is the daughter of Mike and Louise, who own Castle Gardens in Sherborne, has been snapped up by major publisher Harper Collins. Her debut novel is a delicious, sassy, ostentatious novel about women's self-advancement in the 19th century. The season is about to begin and there's not a minute to lose. Our heroine, Kitty Talbot, needs a fortune, or rather, she needs a husband who has a fortune. This is 1818, after all, and only men have the privilege of seeking their own riches. With just 12 weeks until Kitty and her sisters are made homeless, launching herself into London society is the only avenue open to her, and Kitty must use every ounce of cunning and ingenuity she possesses to climb the ranks. The only one to see through her plans is the worldly Lord Radcliffe, and he's determined to thwart her at any cost. Can Kitty secure a fortune and save her sisters from poverty? Time is running out, and no one, not even a lord, will stand in her way. The Sheep's Tale by John Lewis Stemple, priced at £12.99. This is an important book on several levels. Read a few sentences out loud wherever you are. For example, We take a look at the Ryland ewes, white and fat with fecundity, replete with contentment. Contentment is a transmissible condition. I catch it off the sheep. The old-time shepherds used to sleep with their sheep out in the fields. I do it sometimes, too, on the dry nights, the sheep lying down around me. I'm not sure on those nights who's protecting whom. Everybody thinks they know what sheep are like. They're stupid, noisy, cowardly, lambs to the slaughter, and they're sheep-wrecking the environment. Or maybe not. 
Contrary to popular prejudice, sheep are among the smartest animals in the farmyard, fiercely loyal, forming long and lasting friendships. Sheep farmed properly are boons to biodiversity. They also happen to taste good, and their fleeces keep us warm through the winter. Indeed, John Lewis Temple's family supplied the wool for Queen Elizabeth's hose. Observing the traditional shepherd's calendar, the sheep's tale is a loving biography of ewes, lambs, and rams through the seasons. Lewis Stemple tends to his flock with deep-rooted wisdom, ethical consideration, affection, and humour. This book is a tribute to all the sheep he has reared and sheared, from gregarious action ram to sweet maid Marian. In his inimitable style, he shares the tales that only a shepherd can tell. The Night Sky The Night Sky in May 2022. This is Rob Nolan's guide for your stargazing this month. We're in the midst of a galaxy season now, and with the lighter evenings extending, long nights shooting are becoming scarce. The nights are still packed with celestial events, though, if you're prepared to get up early enough to see them. Highlights include close conjunctions of some of our neighbouring planets, a total lunar eclipse, meteors from Halley's Comet, and a possible storm of shooting stars towards the end of the month. So, grab those binoculars or your telescope and get ready to set those alarm clocks. Also on display this month are the bright stars Vega and Arcturus. Look towards Vega on a dark, moonless night, and you may be able to make out a fuzzy patch. This is the great cluster M13 in Hercules, a closely knit globular cluster of around one million stars. That particular cluster may feature as next month's image, if I can get a good shot of it. What to look out for? On the 6th of May, we were treated to a display of shooting stars from the Eta Aquarid meteor shower, caused by tiny pieces of Halley comets burning up in our atmosphere. You had to look up in the early hours of the morning to catch the display. And on the 13th of May, between 1.55 and 2.45 a.m., the moon moved in front of Parima, a large star in the constellation Virgo. And on the 16th of May, there was the possibility of seeing a total lunar eclipse, which was visible from America and in parts of Europe and Africa. Here in the UK, the partial phase started at 3.27 a.m., reaching totality at 4.29 a.m. Grab a pair of binoculars and look low towards the east to spot the crescent moon sailing below Jupiter, Mars and Venus on the respective nights of the 25th, 26th and 27th of May. Another celestial event requiring an early dawn wake-up call. Before dawn on the 29th of May, Mars passes below Jupiter, another one to observe with binoculars. The second potential meteor shower on offer this month is provided courtesy of the debris from comet Schwassam Wachmann 3 during the night of the 31st of May to the 1st of June. This may produce a brief but intense storm of shooting stars known as the Tau Herculid meteor shower, with the best views offered once again before dawn. The comet itself is still in the process of breaking up, a process which began when the comet first started to fracture in 1995. Politics. All views are welcome by Simon Hoare. Every day that the House of Commons sits, the day's proceedings begin with prayers. Those prayers are led by the Speaker's chaplain. We pray for wise counsel for the Queen, the Commonwealth and for the country. We pray that we be motivated by the best intentions and that we set aside all private interests and prejudices. This part of the parliamentary day is never broadcast. It is intensely private. Irrespective of the Speaker's religion, if indeed they have any, the chaplain must be drawn from the Anglican Church. The Palace of Westminster is just that, a palace. The chaplaincy is known as a royal peculiar, a somewhat peculiar title of itself, because the appointment is made with the permission and agreement of the Sovereign. The Sovereign herself is, of course, Supreme Governor of the Church of England. At the other end of the building, in the House of Lords, Church of England bishops sit by dint of office solely because we have an established church, and that church has to be represented within the legislature, the Lord Spiritual and Temporal. 
The Lord Chancellor of England and Wales is involved with the recommendation of bishops to the Sovereign. The upcoming Queen's speech will conclude with the time-honoured phrase, I pray that the blessings of Almighty God may rest upon your councils. The relationship between the established church and the state is manifest and intricately interwoven. It will remain so unless or until the Church of England is disestablished. I gleaned from Radio 4, another national treasure, that only the UK and Iran have clerics within their respective legislatures as a matter of right. I shall leave that particular fact there. I raise the above to try to demonstrate why it is perfectly proper for our religious leaders to be able to speak on issues of politics or policy. They do so from a moral, ethical starting point. Those bishops can make their points in the House of Lords, and no one would bat an eyelid. But some would have you believe, make it from the pulpit, and the terrors of hell are unleashed, and the foundations of civilization shaken to their very core. Commentary from our religious should be challenging, thought-provoking, and invite soul-searching. Woe betide, we should have clerics along the lines of, are you being served, young Mr. Grace, who only seemed to intone, you're all doing very well. I am a Roman Catholic and wear my faith lightly. I try not to moralise or believe I can deduce the views of the Almighty myself. I like to hear the views of leaders of all religions. However, what I do know is that Christ's message at the forefront of so many minds during the Easter season was challenging. Outcast shepherds rather than local notables at the nativity stable. Prostitutes, tax collectors welcomed. The innocence of children preferred over their elders. Hypocrisy, pride and hubris all shot down. The poor rewarded over the rich. If Christ himself challenged the rulers of the day, faced into the accepted wisdoms, grabbed people and shook them, why shouldn't those who carry forward the apostolic message today? It is indeed their duty and calling to do so. Criticism is never comfortable to hear. We are all human. We know that. But being uncomfortable and challenged is a necessary part of our daily and political discourse. We cannot shy away from it. Criticism is not always right. It does not necessarily lead to a government or public policy having to be changed or abandoned. It does not always have to be elegantly phrased or robed in some Delphic, nuanced cloak that is beyond understanding to all but the mystics. Sometimes I will agree. Other times I won't. However, I will champion up until the end their right to speak out. Any politician who seeks to diminish that right, belittle the speaker or mute the voice, cannot lay legitimate claim to the mantle of Democrat or demonstrate an understanding as to how our delicate and centuries-developed modus operandi works. Do you have any questions for MP Simon Hoare? Simon has agreed to an open Q&A in the BV June issue. If you have any questions for the North Dorset MP, now's your opportunity. Ask him about his voting record, his opinion on Partygate, his works in Northern Ireland, a pressing local issue, or maybe his preference for toasted tea cakes. This is a great opportunity to put your questions and suggestions to your local MP, and he's promised to answer as many as space allows. Simply email your question by the 22nd of May to letters at theblackmoorvale.co.uk Please include your full name and village or town. We all unknowingly work out every day by Mel Mitchell. When it comes to training in the gym, I always encourage people to incorporate functional movements as opposed to isolated exercises, which only train specific muscles. It is important to train the muscles that we require for simple everyday tasks, such as picking things up from the floor. It's easy for these basic movements to become difficult as we get older if we don't keep using those muscles properly. There are seven established basic movement patterns, the most common five I've outlined below with tips on practicing them. The hinge. The hinge is the movement we perform when picking things up from the floor, and we all know how hard that gets as you age. Training this movement, for example with deadlifts or kettlebell swings, can not only help strengthen the muscles involved, but also allow you to develop the capability and perfect the form required to lift without damaging your back. The squat. This is a movement that we do more often than people think. 
you are essentially squatting whenever you are sitting down in a chair or coming back up again from it. Even sitting on the toilet is a squatting motion. So why would you not train this movement? Exercises such as front and back squats are a great addition to any gym program. The lunge. Lunging is a single leg movement. Everyday movements such as climbing stairs or stepping forward to throw a ball for the dog are all forms of lunging. It's important to note that lunging is not one-dimensional and should be trained in all directions in order to improve balance, strength, flexibility and overall mobility. The push. Pushing objects away from our body is another fundamental movement that we use every day. Movements such as pushing ourselves up from the floor or lifting objects above our head to place on a shelf are common examples of this movement pattern. Adding exercises such as press-ups and the overhead press are a great way of strengthening this movement. And finally, the pull. Obviously, this is the opposite movement to push, literally pulling objects towards your body. Although we don't necessarily do much of this movement every day, other than pulling people in for a good old cuddle, this movement is essential for training and maintaining good posture. Any of the row exercises and gym machines, such as the lateral pull-down, are brilliant for this movement pattern. Right, well, I think pulling or pushing a cup of coffee, Terry, what do you think? Does that count as well, exercise? I, I don't know. Let's go and try anyway. You've been listening to the BV Magazine podcast for May 2022, Episode 3. Join us again next month.